Michigan State's College of Osteopathic Medicine provides an innovative patient-centered curriculum with multiple specialties and multiple opportunities for clinical exposure. Sound appealing? Well, plug in your earbuds because today I'm speaking with the Senior Associate Dean of Admissions at Michigan State University's College of Osteopathic Medicine. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 537th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for joining me today. Are you ready to apply to your dream medical schools? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted's Med School Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash medquiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, take the quiz at accepted.com slash medquiz to obtain your free assessment. Dr. Katherine Ruger earned her undergraduate degree at Northwood University, her master's in counseling and sports psychology at Wayne State, and her PhD in education and organizational leadership from Pepperdine University. She started at MSU College of Osteopathic Medicine as an admissions counselor in 2009 and has assumed increasing responsibilities ever since. Since August 2022, almost exactly a year ago, she has served as a senior associate dean of admissions and student affairs at Michigan State University's College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Worker, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you, Linda. Great. Now, can you give us, just to start, an overview of MSU's DO program, focusing on its more distinctive elements? Sure, I'd love to. MSU COM, which is what I'll refer to it during the course of the session, is a really special place. I think it has a lot to do with the type of people that we recruit and attract, both from an admissions perspective as well as faculty and staff. Certainly, it's a college of osteopathic medicine, and so our training really revolves around that holistic approach and focusing on preventative medicine. But we're looking for students and faculty and staff who have a commitment to service, a heart for leadership, and that type of community just inspires a lot of growth, curiosity, excitement. So it's a really wonderful place to be. And I know that I'm biased in saying that perhaps, but I think something that sets us apart is that we're part of Michigan State University and we have a lot of wonderful access to resources as part of the university. Our college is committed to local community outreach as well as international outreach. So a lot of reasons why folks want to be part of our community is because they get to serve different populations of people. So we have street medicine, which is where our students um, in partnership with clinicians get to go and work with individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So that's more on the local level. And then from an international perspective, we have renowned faculty that are trying to cure malaria in Malawi. We have students going out there and doing medical missions. We have them going to Peru and Guatemala. And so it's really fun to be able to get them involved in a lot of different ways. And it tends to be a reason why, again, folks want to be here. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, you mentioned the community focus as well as the international focus. That's kind of a a balancing act, I assume. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that you have three campuses and you also mentioned that it's obviously an osteopathic school. How do both the ability to study on three different campuses and the osteopathic nature of the program affect the educational experience for MSU students? Ah, oh, good question. And one that I've not been asked. I The first thing I thought of was the interconnectedness of systems, which is kind of like the osteopathic philosophy in general. And so because students can start their preclinical years or years one and two of medical school in Detroit, in Clinton Township, or in East Lansing, Michigan, they have the opportunity to kind of select their geography, um, certainly kind of the, the vibe, if you will, across those campuses. Um, but at the same time, there's an interconnectedness. So students can be part of student organizations or clubs together. So there wow. it may be an executive board of, for example, the street medicine club that I had mentioned before, and there may be a president and vice president from across the three sites. So they collaborate quite a bit. In fact, an hour ago, I was in a stop the bleed training 
with students and they are part of an organization called Community Integrative Medicine. And so they reach out and do health fairs and things like that with the community, but also help train themselves to be able to be the, you know, on the front line of some injuries and whatnot. And, and the person who was instructing that particular workshop was from our Detroit campus, but they were hosting it in East Lansing to make sure that the local folks got trained in those skill sets. And so there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. And then once students go out to their third and fourth year of medical school, which is their clinical year, they have the opportunity to complete training amongst about 30 different hospitals throughout the state of Michigan. And so there's an opportunity there to kind of reconnect with classmates that they may or may not have experienced um, preclinical years together and get a kind of a feel for a different type of hospital and geographical setting. Sure. Now for the three campuses, I'm afraid I'm just not that familiar with the geography. How, how like in driving time, for example, how Mm -hmm. far apart are they? You know, traffic and the construction era is a little bit tough to predict, but I would say that they are within two hours of each other, but be more specific to that from East Lansing to Macomb, it's probably an hour 20, hour 30 from Macomb to Detroit, maybe 45 minutes to an hour, depending on traffic and Detroit to East Lansing, an hour, hour 15 traffic, weather, all those, all those good things. Exactly. So we joke about creating some underground tunnels. So just (laughs) faculty interconnectedness of systems. (laughs) Right, right, right. But it's, in other words, they're not, they're not silos. They really can connect. They can connect and they do. And we, we share an administration across the three sites. Me personally, I make sure to go to Detroit and Macomb and East Lansing regularly to be able to interact with students, understand the student experience and make sure for the most part that it's equitable and they are all getting the same quality of education. Okay, wonderful. Now, does MSUCOM give preference to Michigan State residents? Uh, We do to an extent. So MSU is a state funded land grant institution. So about two thirds of our incoming classes from the state of Michigan, that's two thirds of 300. So it's quite a large class, which means we can provide an enormous opportunity to Michigan residents, but also a pretty large chunk of that is um, for out of state students or international students. And so we have probably between 75 and 100 that are coming from out of the state of Michigan and 200-ish coming from within the state. Right. Okay. Look, there are medical schools with classes that are smaller than that. So the the number of -of out-of-state students you accept. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my uh, argument when people get quickly about in-state, (laughs) out-of-state ratio. Right. Right. You're right. (laughs) Now let's turn to the application itself. Does MSUCOM screen applications before sending out secondaries? We do not screen prior to sending out secondaries. We send secondaries to anyone who wants to proceed with our application cycle, knowing that there are certain averages, um, at least academically, that tend to matriculate into the college. And so we kind of leave it up to the applicant and whether or not they want to continue with the process. Now, MSU has three required secondary essay questions. What do you hope to glean from the secondaries that you don't get from the primary? Mm -hmm. Well, secret is that this next application cycle, there will only be two. So all right. Thank you for that. (laughs) Which one are you getting rid of? Or are you changing Uh, them entirely? entirely. All Uh, right. um, We changed them, Linda, kind of with the theme of prior years. And we understand that the pandemic brought a lot of different challenges for students. And I I acknowledge that a lot of our students that are starting this year in medical school may have been online exclusively for like freshman, sophomore, maybe junior years of college. And I think that's maybe a detriment to some of their ability to develop their social skills, professional skills. And so we're really looking to help foster that development um, and also assess where they are currently. And so our secondary questions really are asking more about certainly applicants' interest in our college specifically, but more so diving a little bit more deeply into what kind of mindset they may be coming in with and what their approach is to understanding professionalism, what is important to them about that if they have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset, um, because we're, we're seeing that those qualities are really important. Yeah, yes, exactly. 
Bingo. I gave each of my kids a copy of her book when they started having children. Good. Yeah. And who's ever listening to this, you should go get that book too. We have I no agree. <laughs> I agree. Mindset. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So yeah. getting back to secondaries, uh, as opposed to my reading taste. So you're looking for a growth mindset, obviously, and as well as why they're, they're interested in MSU Com, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Are you concerned at all about the impact of chat GPT and the essay component of the application process, either the primary or the secondary? That's, that's the big question, right? That is the big question. Who isn't concerned about it? And I would be interested to hear from other colleagues, their perspectives. It's tricky because it's either chat GPT or it's 30 different people looking and editing somebody's essay before they submit it ultimately anyway. So that destroys it. Yeah. And so I think the purpose of the essay is to try to get to know the candidate on a personal level. And if that can be achieved more effectively through chat GPT, there's nothing we can do about it. I guess there's plagiarism technology tools that we can use perhaps, but I think the bottom line is we're trying to get to know the applicants. They, some of them previously maybe came in with the advantages of having an English professor as a parent and probably went through the chat GPT informally, but you know, we're going to just, kind of see how it goes and make some changes accordingly if we need to. I would encourage applicants to tell their story authentically uh, because I think we'll start to get to know which ones are real and which ones may not be. And they're going to be challenged in the interview process to really show up in a consistent way too and be asked questions about the things that they say are most important to them. Right. Um, it's it's been very interesting because I have been asking that question to a lot of interviewees in different professional categories, graduate categories. The responses vary from I'm really worried about it to it's out there. I don't I don't see any difference between them going to chat GPT or, or going to um their friends. And you know, when I've played with it just just for fun, it's it tends to be very generic. Mm-hmm. It does not, it, it can't produce something individual. Yes. And yeah. one of our consultants, and I can, I can link to that in the show notes. She, she try. she's a journalist when she's not doing an admissions consulting and she is obviously a very good writer. She decided to, to try and write an application essay using chat GPT. And by the time she got to the level of specificity that she knew would make, that was required to make a good essay, to create a good essay, she'd spend as much time with chat GPT as if she'd written it herself. <laughs> Yes, it probably felt better about it ultimately if she had written it. Herself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she she's you know she has her master's. She's she's well beyond applying to grad school. She's been there, done that. But um, it was an interesting exercise. It's not just a matter of whether it was generic or not generic. No, it's in order to make it good, she had to work as hard or harder than if she had just written it. Yeah. And you can say, well, she's a, a experienced writer. Yeah, but you're going to have to work harder to make it authentic. Yes. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. So we have to learn to live with it and maybe even embrace it in a lot of ways. Right. Certainly in medicine, they're embracing it. Certainly. Yes. And that I'm hopeful about. How do you think the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action and admissions or race race conscious admissions will affect uh, MSU Com? And should applicants do anything differently in light of the decision, emphasize something differently? Yeah, that's a great question and something that we as admissions professionals have been talking about across the country. What's unique, I guess, about Michigan and Michigan State University is that affirmative action was banned in 2006. And so we've been living this way for a really long time. And what we've done to try to address the barriers is to create pathway programs early on. So our college, for example, has a robust system of pathway programs for high school students to attend summer camp here called OsteoChamps. We do um, a program that's called Future Docs with DO capitalized, of course, in Detroit, in Lansing, and in Clinton Township for, again, high school students. And those programs feed into a scholars program that is more undergrad centric, but will give them opportunities to engage with osteopathic medicine. Um, There's some academic incentives to be able to continue with the program. If they meet certain academic requirements, their MCAT is waived, and then they get preferential admission into the medical school. So things like that, uh, we're focusing on building those programs. Um, We're focusing on 
um, making sure that we are represented in areas in Michigan that may be underserved or that may not know as much about osteopathic medicine to help educate the community that this could be an option for them. And so those are some of the strategies that we've employed so far. We've always reviewed applicants holistically, and I think that helps a lot. So we'll continue to adopt those practices and learn from colleagues at other institutions and see if there are more strategies that we can employ to make sure that the students that we recruit and graduate can meet the diverse needs of the state and the country as a whole. So for you, basically, the, the, the Supreme Court decision made no difference because you- Not in terms of what we do on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis. I, I think that some institutions are fearful, as are we, about it impacting the ability to have like affinity groups, for example, in the really? college and the student life aspect of it. So the clubs and organizations. And so we'll we'll just have to see what the impact this might have long term. But for now, that's correct. Nothing has changed in terms of the rules and policies that we need to abide by in Michigan. Okay. What is a common mistake that you see applicants making either in the primary or secondary applications? <laughs> it's funny. The first thing that pops in my mind is grammar and <laughs> making sure that proper nouns are capitalized, <laughs> but that's more of a me thing. I think that applicants tend to feel compelled to tell us what they think we want to hear. Like I need to fit in this box. What is the box and how do I place myself in that? Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of like boilerplate kind of language. And so I would just, I don't know, I guess I encourage people to be themselves, to be authentic, which I know is really tough because we, we force students to try to fit in the box through this process. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're telling them not to try to fit in the box. And, and so it's more of just telling us authentically who they are and what, draws them to this profession rather than feeling like they need to sell themselves hard in the application process. I think the admissions committee members are really interested in hearing their story, just authentic story and being real about it. Okay, great answer. Thank you. Awesome. Now I saw on your website that the interviews this year are going to be all virtual on online, correct? Yes. Um, what can a lucky interviewee expect? <laughs> You know, the process evolves every year, kind of like our secondary application process. But um, what I think is really wonderful about our experience is that we have hundreds of engaged alumni and faculty members in the process. And because we've been able to move towards a virtual interview process, really thanks to the pandemic, I suppose, sure. um, it allows us to leverage alumni from all over the country. So the physician that I mentioned is working in Malawi, like she's one of our interviewers. And so she may be interviewing a candidate from Malawi, or we have graduates from California or Denver or wherever, and they get to just appreciate a nice one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, and, and it tends to be more casual, more conversational than drilling a student on whatever it is that we want to ask about. So I think that it's it tends to be a pleasant experience. We also invite them, and this is optional though, but to participate in uh, webinars that help them understand a little bit more about the college. Whereas historically, pre-COVID, if you will, we would bring everyone to the college, we would present to them about the college, we would interview them. And as you can imagine, if you're preparing for an interview mentally and you're attending a presentation about a college, you're probably not mm. actually retaining any of the information. You, your mind is probably just completely blank at that point because yeah. you're so nervous. And so we found that it may be more effective to interview first than offer some webinars in the evening hours kind of after the pressure's off and have a more optional experience, then they can really engage in the experience, ask questions, retain information, and feel like the pressure's off a little bit. And not have the cost of travel. Of travel. The cost, oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, yeah, and I guess they only have to buy like a half of a suit since. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's been done. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, pajamas on the bottom, and <laughs> right. Now, again, citing the, the MSU site, it says that MSUCOM received 7,656 applications for admission in 2023. Approximately how many are in your M1 class? 
And how do you win it down from 7K plus to 300? Exactly. Right. We have about 300 in each incoming class. And just going back to the sites, usually 200 are in East Lansing, 50 in Detroit and 50 in Macomb and in terms of disbursement. How do we whittle it down? It's really hard because there are so many more qualified, good candidates for medical school than there are seats. And so it's a really tough job and one that our admissions committee takes incredibly seriously. What we're looking for is in the screening process, and then we interview, and then we review those results, and then we go back to the admissions committee. We're looking for academic prowess. Of course, we want to make sure that students are going to be able to succeed in the curriculum and not end up having to leave with a lot of debt, but really to apply it towards medicine. And then we're looking for folks who can advance our mission and who are interested in serving the community, who are interested in being strong healthcare leaders and frankly, disrupting medical, the medical healthcare experience. And so we find that through different work experiences, the way in which students can self-reflect, whether or not they have a growth mindset, what impact that they've had on the community so far, and the way in which they may be able to discuss osteopathic medicine, like what, how that resonates with them and or connects to their uh, goals. So it's, it's not easy and it takes a whole year and sometimes overlapping with the former admissions process to make those decisions. Right. Okay. Now, the, again, citing the website, it, you know, your website encourages applicants to have not just clinical exposure and community service, but exposure to osteopathic medicine specifically. Is that kind of experience a deal breaker? And is research, not osteopathic specifically, but is research a nice to have or something you really like to see in applicants? Yeah. Those two so, separate questions, really. Yeah, I think I can, I can try to tackle them. The osteopathic exposure is, of course, important to us because we want to make sure that candidates understand and appreciate what they're signing up for. That being said, there are limited opportunities for students, for example, in Canada, where there are no DO schools um, or many osteopathic practitioners yet, to be able to have shadowing opportunities or mentorship opportunities, et cetera. And so we appreciate that and kind of take into consideration the whole person and what they've had the opportunity to engage with, or even how they've talked about learning about the profession in general. The research piece, it's nice to have research experience because it contributes to a student's ability to critically think and ask good questions, especially in the clinical setting as they're trying to um, challenge certain medical procedures, et cetera. It's not a requirement. We think, care more about the impact in the community and the clinical piece than we do the research piece, but it's certainly of value. If students have it, we're not going to use them and use it again. <laughs> right. Okay. I asked about mistakes like on the primary and, and the secondary. What about mistakes in the interview? What are some common mistakes that you see there? Or, or do you, is there anything that you could point to? Timeliness is really important. And we make sure that we communicate time zones <laughs> pretty thoroughly, especially because we have more out-of-state students coming into the class. So I think making sure that there's conscientiousness when planning on attending an interview, that the technology and the Wi-Fi connections are good. And sometimes that comes from our side as an issue. And so if, if there's an issue uh, um, with faculty who are interviewing a, st a student, just being able to be agile in that moment, um, be understanding and flexible with any kind of change that has to be made, um, that's really important. Treating everyone on the staff with respect and grace is all part of the process and is all part of the interview. So I think that's really important to trying to think of other things, just being conscientious again about what applicants choose to discuss and um, what questions they select to ask is kind of shows their um, emotional maturity and emotional intelligence, which is one of the most important factors for successful uh, students in the clinical setting, at least. I think that's it. That's all I can think of right now. It, I guess maybe different in person, but from a virtual perspective, there's only so many things that can happen. Right, right. 
<laughs> no, I think you're, you know, your point about how students interact with really everybody at any school they're interviewing is, is highly relevant. I can think of clients who blew it by not speaking respectfully to a receptionist or janitor or whatever applicants. Absolutely. You know, now I have a question I ask every, every admissions director that I speak to medical school admissions director that I speak to. And that is, and I'll tell you why, when do you stop sending out interview invitations? We stop sending out interview and invitations in the kind of mid spring. So I would say latest would be March, early March. Okay. All right. That's fine. The reason I ask is because there's this, this meme out there, which is wrong, that, that <laughs> if you don't have an interview invitation by Thanksgiving, you're toast. Oh, so, no. Uh, yeah. So I started just asking med school admissions director, I interviewed, you know, when do you stop? And not one said they stop at Thanksgiving. So anyway, that's my personal crusade. Yeah. It's um, time to do me. Yeah. Yeah. Now some pre-meds, are concerned that if they don't get into an MD program as opposed to a DO program, they won't match outside of primary care. I noticed that 99% of MSU comm students matched number one, and that 44% went into primary care, which means that 56% went into non-primary care specialties. Can you address that matching concern with a little bit more depth? Yeah, I mean, what is the data? I don't, you can't yeah. argue with the data. I don't know what else to say. Um, I think it was 55%, 1% didn't go and didn't continue. But, anyways, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think historically osteopathic medicine has been associated with primary care because that's kind of how it started. Um, but it's expanded so much throughout the years. And there's a lot of wonderful benefits that osteopathic practitioners can provide to specialty care. You want to, well, again, I would assume that patients would want a physician that would really be trained to look holistically at the patient. There's that special skill of osteopathic manipulative therapy or osteopathic manipulative medicine, however you want to term it, which is more of a hands-on approach to healing. And you can imagine that that skill set is incredibly beneficial in um, occupations like orthopedic surgery, where it's very tactical and mechanical, and you want to be able to feel for things and to make sure that your diagnosis and your treatment is relevant and strong. And so I think that as the community has more demand for that type of care, then there are more opportunities for osteopathic physicians to pursue those, those areas of medicine. So yeah, like I said, the, the data, as you had just referenced, Linda, shows that um, there are opportunities in just about every profession for, for DOs, and it's becoming a high demand for right, patients. Right. I think one of the most common criticisms of, of many doctors, certainly in specialties, is they only look at their specialty. And if the patient presents with something that's outside of their specialty, they don't know what to do with it. Yes. So anyway, how do you view prerequisites taken at a community college as opposed to a four-year university or college? We don't really think much about it, to be honest with you. As you long think, as they're... You don't think much about it in the sense that it's not a big deal to you or that it's you just not don't... a big deal. Okay. Yeah, it's not a big deal. I, prerequisites are prerequisites. If they're at the one and 200 level where I would have more concern is when we are asking for upper level science courses. So three, 400 level courses that aren't typically offered at a community college level, yeah. those really need to come from a university. So that would, an example of that might be like a 300 level biochemistry class um, or other like non-prerequisites, but highly encouraged classes like anatomy or physiology or pharmacology and all the other allergies. Okay. And shadowing is, is shadowing. Let's talk about in-person shadowing. Is that something you really like to see? And what about virtual shadowing, which, you know, in the wake of the pandemic, I assume you're still some, some, sometimes seeing it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. I think the goal in asking for some kind of experience, and it doesn't have to be shadowing, it can be work experience, it can be volunteer experience, is to just verify that students really want this and they've experienced it firsthand and they still want to do it. And, right. and so whether that's via shadowing or if students are working as a scribe or working as a medical assistant, um, it doesn't really matter how they achieve it. It's just, it's nice 
for us to know that like, you know what you're getting yourself into because you don't want your first clinical experience to be during medical school when you've already committed and put so much work into going in this direction in your career. And then some, you find out like, oh, actually I don't, I don't like this very much. I don't want to be part of this community anymore. And and somebody else really would have liked to. So um, it would, it's good to figure that out sooner than later. Absolutely. But we're not well, saying that somebody has to come in with 1200 hours of anything. It's more of like the quality of experience and what impact it had on them. And the, re- the reflection upon that experience probably is important too, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. What would you have liked me to ask you? I guess what a, any outside of other advice, um, please applicants. And, you know, I, I talked to our students about this, what a lot of authors call the paradox of excellence. It's just like, I've had to be so great. I kind of alluded to earlier being in that, that box. And I think it breeds the sense of comparison, like students, applicants compare themselves to other applicants, students compare themselves to other students, and it's really unproductive, and um, everybody has their own story, and so if I could say anything to whoever's listening, don't compare yourself to anyone else, don't feel like you have to be whatever they are, and they, they've accomplished whatever they have, everybody has a different story, and different experiences, and different strengths to bring to the table, so just leverage yours, and get excited about things that you're passionate about, not things that you feel like you're compelled or forced to have done because of this like paradox of excellence in, in, in the pre-med world, if you will, if that makes any sense whatsoever. That was great advice. That was great advice. It made sense to me. I sometimes, it's not the same, but you mentioned paradox. I frequently say that the paradox of the, at the heart of admissions is that you have to both fit in, show that you fit in and that you stand out. Yes. And I think- <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that is at the heart of admissions, but I, I also think that comparing yourself then is, is completely and totally useless because of that standing out part of it. You, you can't know. So don't bother. Don't waste emotional energy doing that. Follow Dr. Ruger's advice and just be the best person you can be. How's that? Okay. Sure. I think we're almost out of time. I want to thank you, Dr. Ruger, so much for joining me and sharing your expertise. This has been wonderful. Do you have a URL you want to give for MSU.com or I can just look it up and and link to it? Yeah, just com.msu.edu. Okay, Uh, great. All right, we're going to link to that from exhibit.com slash 537. That's 537. And we're going to include links in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 537 to other resources as well, including that blog post article I mentioned on chat GPT, which uh, might be helpful to listeners. Thank you listeners also for joining me. And a quick reminder, don't miss the med school admissions quiz. Find out if you're really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the free quiz at exhibit.com slash med quiz today. All one word is med quiz, M-E-D-Q-U-I-Z. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.